Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants, and welcome to episode 38 of Secret Source, the restaurant marketing podcast. How to buy a restaurant and the traps to avoid. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success. Your secret sauce. Welcome back, everyone. I've been really quite amazed at the feedback that we've had on our podcast about creativity and innovation. And I think it really sort of highlights the fact that not a lot of people have been talking about just how important innovation is, just how important it is to show that creativity to your customers, to your staff, to your suppliers in your business in general. So if you haven't had a listen to it, I'll include a link in the show notes. Really important. And I think it's been great. I've consulted widely on that podcast. And I think that there's some really good gems in there. And it's what we've done is we've surfaced some, surfaced some of the things that we do, that I personally do, to help me be more creative in running marketing for restaurants. Today, I'm really excited to be talking to Robbie Doyle from Buy, Grow, Sell, A Business. So he is a business broker in Perth. Why would we be talking to him? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, he sells and buys restaurants for a living. That's what he does. So he gets to see a lot of the deals that go down. Two other reasons that I think are really important. His business isn't called buy, sell a business. It's called buy, grow, sell a business. So Robbie really is focused on helping people with that middle part of the business. So growing their restaurant business. More importantly, Robbie's had a career as a chef, as a highly acclaimed chef, very successful. So he has seen it from the other side the side that you're looking at it now. So he's got an amazing insight into how restaurants stack up financially. From a business point of view, I think he's almost got a really unique point of view in what makes a restaurant successful, how to buy them and how to sell them and how to grow them. So we're really lucky to have Robbie on the podcast. Let's have a chat with him now. Hey, Robbie, welcome to the show. Hi, James. Great to be on Excellent. So do you want to just give us a little bit about your background and and who you are and what you do today? Sure, James. My background is uh, I was a chef for over 25 years and I have also spent the last 10 years in commercial real estate. Um, I have been a leasing agent for huge, large agencies and I also specialize in selling hospitality businesses and other small businesses too. Um, And I live in Perth. And yeah, and I'm enjoying my life. I've recently just set up my own agency, buy, grow, sell a business, and um, I'm having a whale of a time. Awesome. It's lovely out there in Perth. And uh, you would get to see oh. all sorts of interesting restaurant deals being made. Oh, James, it's never ending. You know, if you know, it's almost like the wave of migration. You know, traditionally, you had, when I came here in 2000, you had a lot of Italian restaurants, a lot of Greek restaurants. Um, Vietnamese restaurants and it's a changing environment as new ideas younger restaurant owners enter the game and older ones exit it's changing it's constantly changing and it's it's great because there's new ideas coming through new trends what I'm noticing at the moment is that there's a lot of emphasis on health and um, provenance where does the product come from is it gluten-free is it sugar-free um, was the chicken happy it, was the cow treated with respect you know and it's like consumers now have a conscience and I'm seeing that affecting success rates in restaurants. People want to know the, the content of the menu, the provenance. It is definitely one of the big trends that we're seeing. So tell me, and we see this all the time, you, you see people and you wonder why they started in the restaurant industry. What do you think from, from your experience, which is a fairly unique position being a chef and a, you know buying and selling these businesses on behalf of people, what do you see as being the right and wrong motivations for buying a restaurant? James, I have to tell you, there's only one motivation for buying a restaurant, and that's to make money. And people might criticize me for saying that, but make money first and then be noble afterwards. If you're not focused on money, if you don't start with a plan, 
if you don't do your costings and your recipe sheets prior to opening, you will not have time to do it afterwards. So the motivation to open it is to make money. The wrong motivations, I believe, are, oh, well, it looks easy. Oh, I always wanted a restaurant. Oh, I'm, t- I'm sick of my job. I don't want to fly in and fly out to the mines anymore, or I don't want to be working in an office anymore. And I, I just want a restaurant or a cafe because it's easy. This misconception that the industry is attractive and glamorous. They're watching programs on TV. They think it's easy. They, they don't see the edited. They, get, they see the edited version of the program, but not the reality of, you know, worrying about needing payroll or staff shortages or skill shortages or poor investment in sit outs or all the hundreds of other little factors that kick in later to after you've committed to um, buying a restaurant. I always find it completely amazing because it's just in time manufacturing for an ever changing customer base with a very difficult employment environment where you're employing people who work very, very hard and because the profitability is not there, they don't get paid a lot of money. It's got all of the things that would make you think that it's probably the worst industry ever to get into and yet people flippantly just let's buy a cafe, let's buy a restaurant without any planning whatsoever and it's... Absolutely, James. Uh, Yeah. You know, everyone's got that dream. I would love to own a restaurant. I know. Or to have their grandmother's recipe for scones or homemade jam. That's it. Or or pasta or, or whatever it is. You know, I'm not criticizing. Everyone has great fond memories, but translating it into a commercial reality and making a dollar or being able to pay yourself at the end of the week is a different reality to romanticizing about it. And I'm not a, I'm not cynical. I'm, I'm a practical person. I love the restaurant industry. I love the innovations, the changes. But I hate to see young people or even older people losing their savings. Absolutely. Losing their, yep. their parents' money. You know, it could be a second or third generation of money. <clears throat> James, I'll tell you a quick story. About four years ago, I sat on a little wall in just off the CBD off St. George's Terrace here in Perth with a Cray fisherman. He was a hard-working man. He was in his late 50s, early 60s. Big, strong man, gnarly fingers, tough as nails, and he was crying. And I sat beside him because his son had just closed the doors of a huge restaurant that he had installed in the base of an iconic tower uh, in the CBD in Perth. And he said to me, I put my arm around him. I said to him, look, you know, he said to me, Robbie, where's my money? My money's gone. He had tears running down his face. He said, I've worked all my life. My father has worked all his life. And he said, and, and we've lost everything. Uh, and I said to him, oh, look, uh, I know, but we can, you know, we'll try and get you something. Uh, I, you know, we, I'll talk to the landlords for you, which I, I was in the process of doing. But he went on to tell me that he was going to lose his house. His father was going to lose his house. So three generations, the operator of the cafe, or a restaurant, bar, was, had lost his home. The, the fa- his father and then the grandfather had lost everything because it was a 1.2 million fit out, all, lots of Italian marble, glamorous. It looked like the set of James Bond, a James Bond movie. And it was opened up in the CBD. So it comes back down to what, what customer base were they chasing? You know, in the office tower um, uh, above it, people don't drink. You know, you don't, it's not cool to drink at lunchtime. Uh, you might have a sundowner on a Friday and then you go home. You go back out to the suburbs. And then the, at that time, the inner city of Perth was quite quiet. Now it's changing. But they literally blew their stack. They lost their shirt. That's a really All sad gone. story, isn't it? And, and the sad thing is that it's, it's repeated yeah. with various variations oh. so often. It's just, yeah, it's sad. You know, and, you know, it, all they have to do is, is the, the two most inquest, important questions, James, in my experience, you ask yourself these two questions. Who are my customers and what do they want? Answer those two questions and write the answers on paper. And on that, build your plan. Supply the need of your customers. And if you can't think of who your customers are, don't buy a restaurant yet. Wait, pause, take your time. It's like if you miss a car, a a, a taxi, don't worry. There'll be three more in, in five minutes. Don't worry about it. There's always going to be something to lease. There's always going to be something to buy. Just don't rush into it. Do your sums. Exactly, yep. What are the big mistakes that you see people making when they buy a restaurant? 
James, I would say a lack of planning and and lack of negotiation skills. They commit themselves to a lease. They have no clue about what their occupancy costs should be as in regard to their amount of sales they're generating. They don't even know what the percentages are to go, ah, she'll be right, yeah, the lovely spot. They've not, they don't do a comparison. Like, I mean, you, if you were going to buy a house or buy a car, you test drive the car. You'd look at see who has the best deal, who's going to give you a sport package, who's going to throw in a sunroof. If you were buying a house, you'd drive around, you go to a home open. But they come along and they just jump either into a lease or they jump into a restaurant premises and they don't even realize there's 101 problems. What if, if, if there's residents above you, will they complain about the noise later on? Um, will people smoke in your alfresco? Will the smoke drift upstairs? Well, when they empty the bottles from a busy weekend into the recycling, um, will that cause acoustic um, interference? Will there be noise pollution? There's 101 things that they just don't think about. They're all racing to get in and open their little restaurant or cafe. Um, there's, there's 101 things that can go wrong. Um, and planning, just do your plan. Talk to professionals. It, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Form a relationship with a smart bookkeeper or a, a smart accountant and get your marketing plan in done as you start. Don't start your restaurant without a marketing plan. You have to know who and how you're going to attract your customers to your problem. Don't hope. Hope is for 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 fools. Yeah. Absolutely. I hope, yeah. I hope it doesn't rain, or I hope you know whatever. <laughs> you keep hoping. I'll carry an umbrella. Um, <laughs> seriously, I'm not. You know, it's just yeah. It's so they just rush you in, and and there are a lot of leasing agents out there who just want to do the deal. They just want to sign you up. They see you as a paycheck. They get paid, and if you don't ask for the terms at the beginning, you won't get them afterwards. So you won't get a contribution afterwards because you're on the hook. We have you on the lease. We have a personal guarantee. We have your bank guarantee as well. Exactly. And I think that's one of the really interesting, it's our pet peeve, obviously, that people don't have a marketing plan. or And then they get to this point where the business isn't quite dead, but they don't have any money to spend on marketing, but they need to spend on marketing. And then you've got this horrible catch-22. And or they far do too the often wrong marketing. Yep, yep. Far too many times the food's great, the price is great, you know, everything's great. And they end up with the best restaurant that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> absolutely. That's absolutely. Or to rely, you know, or somebody from the community newspaper rings and says, hey, we're doing a leaflet drop. And instead of saying, well, what's your success rate? What return should I get on that leaflet drop? Um, it, they go, well, how much is it? Oh, I don't know. You know, it's too little, too late. Social media is, and dealing with a professional to guide you on to how to maximize that free resource, it's usually free, um, is back in my day, I mean, James, we didn't even have the internet. I know I, I sound like a dinosaur <laughs> when I say this. There was no Facebook. You know, I was hungry. I just needed to get people in there. I used to stand at my door and I'd give samples away. I, I'd say, hey, will you taste that and tell me what you think? Um, I'd get, engage them in conversation, the old-fashioned old art of talking to a customer. What would you like? You know, and, and then knowing what what makes your restaurant unique. Do you have a unique selling point? Is it quirky? Is it is it on trend? You know, are and you are you giving people what they want? Exactly. And there's so many people who who that is a foreign concept. It's like, well, we cook great Italian food, or we cook great yeah. Indian food, and it's like, congratulations. You're I'm sure of, they do. You're yeah, one yeah. of ten thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, but that's not a plan. That's a statement. That's your pride kicking in, you know, where you defend your nana's recipe or you defend your dad's recipe for for doing whatever, yep. you know, how yep. you used to catch a fish and, and cook it on the beach. But translate that into a, a presenting a dish on a table and making money from it. And I keep going back to making money. If you don't want, if your motivation is not to make money, then, you know, either you've won lotto and you just want to be, you know, you want to um, have a hobby. Don't buy a restaurant as a hobby. Buy it to make money. <laughs> Plan to make money. So uh, where do you see the big buying opportunities then for someone who's looking to buy a Um, restaurant? Where where do you think people should be sort of looking? I'll tell you what what I believe is going to trend is um, health. And I know this makes sense. I'm going to say a couple of things here. I'll rattle them off. But if you can put them into a a cocktail shaker and shake it up, you need to have gluten-free, you need to have sugar-free, you need to have vegetarian, and you need to have paleo. And you need to satisfy that group somehow. And you need to have calories. Um, uh, what is the calorie intake of each dish? And 
that is a step beyond traditionally doing your, your costing sheet on your recipes. What's the yield? What's the wastage? You need to dig deeper. And you need to be able to educate your people. If you eat this salad, if you have this item for breakfast, you can still have such and such a thing. And there's your calorie count for the rest of the day. I know on the ground, I'm getting bombarded by people who want to know what, how good the food is for them. Is it healthy? Is it, you know, there's a lot of people going to gyms. Look at, the, look at the growth of the gym industry in this country. There are massive gyms. I'm dealing with a client who's asked me to find him 2,000 square meters. He's looking for an, uh, an ex bunning site uh, at the moment to turn it into a super gym. And wow. All his clients, yeah, all his clients, and he's also working with me. I'm, I'm consulting with him to design a healthy menu um, whereby you can take a, an idea from your competitors, like um, some of the top juice bars that, that are around. I won't mention brand, other brand names, but you can pinch ideas, you can pinch inspiration. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you put in your juices, you put in your high yield, high margin items, um, eggs. How cheap are eggs? What can you do with an egg? You can poach it, scramble it, fry it, bake it. And it's tasty. It's yummy. You yeah. know, eggs on Cerdo with, with all the other, you know, supporting cast and actors that go with it, avocado or sun-dried tomato or pesto or whatever. Put the items on your menu. Restaurants that are focused on the next generation of the generation that actually buy moisturizer for their face blokes who look after their their skin <laughs> blokes yeah. who look after their their image they have money to spend they're usually not married yet so they still have disposable income and they want to socialize with their friends in a healthy environment and um, that's the trend i see here in perth and i think it's happening as well in sydney and whatever happens in sydney ends up here anyway and it's happening in europe too definitely definitely so what are your thoughts on fit out costs then look what happens is most people, if they're doing it for the first time, they haven't a clue. And they find a designer and they find a builder. And the designer says, what do you want? What inspires you? And they give them an indication and then they come back with a, a design. Let's just stop there. The design cost can cost anywhere from 6 to 18, 20 grand. Let's say $8,000. That's just your, your design. Then you have to do your plans. Then you have to find a builder. Or do you find three builders and get the best quote? Or does the designer or architect for him say, well, actually, we like working with ABC company and they're really good shop fitters. And then you're in, you're hooked, they have you, you're gone. Um, you, you also have perhaps signed a lease. So you're on the slippery slope whereby you're being, I suppose, schmoozed or romanced by these designers who love to be creative and they love spending other people's money. And in this instance, they get a, their jollies by like turning out amazing looking fit outs. But at what cost? How do you get your return on investment from the fit out? You don't. No, you do in some instances, but if you don't, if you get carried away, you can blow 300 to 500, 600,000 in a heartbeat. I've always, before you know. Yeah. yeah, I always think, you know, if you spend $100,000 on fit out or whatever amount, what would your return be if you spent that on Facebook? And. Uh, I've never and seen anyone spend ten percent of it. Even if you spend ten percent of your fit out on Facebook, your, your return would be quantifiable. Well, no one ever spends a hundred thousand dollars. You know, well, very. I, I no. think I would say that very few. I mean, most of the campaigns we run are between three and ten dollars a day, and yet there are people who are dropping hundreds of thousands. I mean, as you said, yeah. a million dollars. Now, yeah. if they'd cut back ten percent, they would have had a, a hundred thousand dollar marketing budget, which. That's two years' absolutely. worth of Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but they don't see the value in it. It, it also depends if, what generation you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with an older generation, they, they haven't yet grasped the importance of social media. But if you're dealing with a younger person, the danger is they're using their old man's money or the dad is supporting them um, or they're borrowing. And if they don't get it right... Um, then, and they overspend, over capital. I have a, a fellow countryman as myself in Perth, and he invested beauty, in three beautiful fit outs for cafes. And he spent in the region of 900,000 for three cafes. And he called me there about a year ago and said to me, Look, I'm just curious, what do you think they're worth? And I said, Well, what are they making? And he said, Oh, well, don't worry about that. But, you know, look at the fit out, look at the work, look at the, that, that, you see that timber there? He said, that, that was done by hand. 
and that marble was chosen. It's all bespoke and the, the pressed tin ceiling is beautiful. And I said, look, I agree with you, but how much money has it made you? Is it making a quid? Oh, well, you know, have a look at this and have a look at the windows. You see, we wanted to catch you the hair and he was ranting and raving and avoiding the question. I said to him, how much are you making? <laughs> Show me the money. And he said to me, and in the end, it worked out, he was netting about, uh, between the three cafes, he was netting about 160. And I said to him, are you joking? You spent 900 to make 160. I said, you could have took a job um, washing pots and pans in the mines and earned 120 and, uh, and be off every third week. And uh, well, why would you spend 900? I said, what do you think your cafes are worth? And he said, well, we were hoping to get a million. And I, I was stunned. I said to him, but where's the correlation between what you're earning and what you're... I mean, and again, his argument was, well, we have this beautiful fit out, this lovely timber, and it's all handmade. And, it's, and it was, but it wasn't putting money into cash register. And yep. I said to, uh, he said to me, well, it may, I'll, I'll go away and talk to my accountant and see what he has to say. So I said, we'll do that. And then get another couple of brokers in and talk to them. And then he came back to me and, I'm, you know, he said to me, you know, we're devastated. We just, this was our house money. We wanted to buy a house with this, with this money. And I said to him, yeah, well, you're making 160 out of it, out of investing 900. And you're working your bum off running around trying to make it happen. Tr running three cafes in the CBD is not easy. But if you overcapitalize and fit out, how do you get it back? Well, and that's the that's that's the really big question. Yeah. So, uh, what role do you see systems playing in restaurant success? Oh, look, I think systems. The first and most important system is your cash register and the information that it can tell you. So you can technically run your cafe from your holiday or from your your house somewhere else. You need you need to have a automated recording and you need to know like a speedometer on a car what speed you're traveling at what's making money what items are not making money and then like a gardener take a shears and snip them away and keep working on it and use your systems a lot of people invest in systems that are never use it they just don't use it you know they have a point of sale system worth thirty five thousand. they have the latest gizmos but they don't actually read the data that it gives them so you need to know what you're doing or subscribe to somebody that will teach you. It's interesting. We had a, a customer who said, he, you know, he was struggling a bit and he wanted some help. And we said, okay, let, let's send an email out. And he goes, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And was like, how many emails have you got? And he goes, oh, I don't have any. I don't collect them. And then we said, well, hang on. A, <laughs> so that's, that's a little bit of a, an issue. But one of the marketing team said, oh, hang on a sec. Aren't you using our free online restaurant booking system? And he goes, yeah. And she goes, well, that collects emails. And there was 1,500 emails in there that he had never sent an email to and he didn't oh. even know that it was collecting it. So he he had probably never even logged into the interface to see all of that information there. And My goodness me. What a waste. Isn't yeah. it? You know, that lovely resource, that all that hard work, <laughs> all there, free. I mean, James, the word free and it's just, you know, it should be highlighted here. You know, what's wrong with you? And it was amazing. And it was it was so interesting because it was easy to, you know, these people had never received an offer. So the, the first email went gangbusters and made a, Absolutely, yeah. made a huge difference. But once again, not using the systems that you've got there. Oh, and look, technology today is so cool. I mean, you can, you can like a sniper, you can target and hit the target. You know, years ago, you, you kind of fired off a shotgun and thought, oh, well, a couple of the pellets might hit the target. Um, but now you can be like a sniper and using the data and the, and the information cleverly, you can sculpt your brand and use it on, uh, by, you have to constantly market. If you stop marketing, you're slowly dying. You're not getting better. And you need to, you need to constantly have that awareness. It's not just, well, I did it when I opened and I don't do it anymore. Or we initially do that. It's like brushing your teeth or tying your shoelaces. You shouldn't have to think about it. You should just do it. And you have to do marketing for your restaurants or your cafe or your franchise or your hotel, motel or whatever, because if you don't, your competitors certainly will. Now, one question that I always find really interesting is should you should you buy a restaurant that's not systematized, knowing that if you go in and systematize it, then you're going to create a lot of value? Or are you better off buying one that's systematized or is it does it depend on what you're trying to achieve out of purchasing the restaurant? Yeah, it comes, look, it comes back down to education. The more study you do 
I mean, if you, if I said to you, I'm going to take you out skydiving and I'll take you up to 10,000 feet and I'll strap on a shoe and I'll push you out the door and you'll have a great time. James, you're going to have a wonderful time. You're going to see all these clouds and then you'll see the earth and then you'll see. And then all you have to do is pull that c- cable and you'll float down. You'd look at me and say, I'm never going to do that. Uh, I, I want to study. I want to take lessons. I want to learn about how to do it. I want to, you know, I want to be safe. And people don't do that. They don't think enough, James. A lot of the time, they just want to, it's like a Christmas present was it for a child. They want to sit on the floor and tear the wrapping off and get in. And when they're at the barbecue with their mates, say, oh yeah, I've been, I own such and such a cafe or I own such and such. It's almost kudos. It's almost cool. But the, the engine room, the, the systems, the marketing, the costings, what gets measured gets done. And if you keep your eye, what your labor cost was, what your food cost was, what's making you money, how do you upsell? You can engineer your menu to make money around that, you know? Yep. And essentially, um, buy, invest in a restaurant if you have, if it has systems, but know how to use the systems or else don't pay for it until you get, get a package that suits your, your, your own brand. Yeah, that's interesting. I've, I've, it is scary that people would buy something that's systematized and then not use it. But I guess, you know, it happens now that I think about it, I have seen it a few times, which is just kind of crazy, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, uh, but the, the, it's quite costly as well. You know, there's a lot of money invested in it. If you're not getting a return on that money, um, you might want that money later on when you're broke or when, when t- or you hit a cold patch or, or you know, there's just a downturn in the economy. I mean, over here in Perth, the mining economy slowed down, so discretionary spending slowed down. Um, but if you go out for a meal or you go out for a coffee, the cafes are full. So you can't, you, you know, you have to know who your customers are and then you have to capture their data and you have to, they're like a tribe, they've joined your tribe and you have to make it interesting for them, send them information, engage with them, give them what they want, know when their birthday is, know when it's an anniversary or what their favorite coffee is and use the systems. Exactly, yep. Do you see many people flipping restaurants, you know, buying a restaurant, 12-month time frame, Yep. Significantly increasing turnover, systematizing it probably, and then selling it, and, and and that's their profit, that's their annual wage. Do you see that happening? Yeah, I have a couple of clients that I work closely with, and they, they give me specifics. They say, ring me, call me, text me, knock on my door when you find something that you know I want. And what they do is they go in, and they uh, do a due diligence. They have the experience. And they will go in with the whole idea of setting it up for sale and they'll have an exit strategy before they even start. So they have in their head, they say, if I want to sell this for 500,000 in two years time, what would, would my weekly sales be? What should they be? Yeah. And what steps do I need to take to do that? And does that include marketing? Does that include uh, a unique selling point or a quirky menu item? And then they follow it religiously and then they systemize it so that they're not required to be there so that the incoming party who wants to buy it doesn't necessarily have to have 20 years hospitality experience, but might want to buy something that is set up professionally that guarantees them an income to replace an income that they might not have the job security for anymore. Yep, yep, yep. Mm. And so there are people who can do that successfully. There are. I've, I've worked with a, a couple who, he's a chef from the UK and his wife is a chef. Yep. And they go in, they buy an underperforming cafe and they know what coffee brands to put in, what coffee machine to put in, how to attract talented baristas. They drive the coffee sales. The coffee sales then add, um, you know, cash turnover, um, quantifiable. They then work a sexy, small, seasonal menu that in the winter or in the summer, you know, soups and slow cooked items in the winter and then light salads with proteins in the summer and a grab and go they they engage with takeaway which is a very important market that a lot of restaurant owners think oh well somebody wants to take away they can ring up and come down yeah like they actively engage in organ you know can we deliver by uh, scooter can we deliver by car will we do it by uber um and and they have a plan for this it's not by accident it's by plan yeah and there's a good living to be made. There's handsome money to be made by doing that. And also what happens is developers and landowners uh, want you then. 
So if if they get, if you get a reputation for running a really cool cafe or a restaurant, when a builder comes along, they'll entice you. They'll offer you incentives, and then that allows you to exit and maybe have a holiday and then get back in the saddle when the new development is built. But it's also you need to have a relationship with somebody like me that you know that has their ear to the ground, that knows the industry, that can join the dots and say, make a phone call and say, look, I know somebody that would do that. I yep, know somebody yep. that would buy, buy this. And then if they pay a fair price, everyone's happy. Nobody wants to be you know stiffed and you know be ripped off and then see their their restaurant sold um, eighteen months later, four times or three times what they what they sold it for. Yeah, is that the kind of multiple uh, that? that- people are achieving oh look it's an average cafe in perth now it's different over east but in perth the the variables and are higher so what i will tell you now if somebody a broker in melbourne would say that wouldn't happen here and you certainly wouldn't get that here in, in sydney either but in perth um at the moment um, it depends on the records you keep are you taking cash and nobody talks about it, but people do. They take cash or they, they take benefits and they don't record it properly. Yep. And I say, to, I say to people, look, you're a fool. Leave the money in. When you want to sell, it, that will add to your multiple. So I don't care if you're pinching 1,500 bucks a week or a grand a week or two grand a week and you're burying it in your backyard in a coffee jar and you're laughing because the ATO don't know what you're doing. Ha, ha, ha. Guess what? No one's going to compensate you for that. No one's going to pay you for you being a criminal or a crook or being dodgy. I'm not criticizing people who do it, but I'm simply saying that people who do it will not get the benefit when they want to sell. They won't get the benefit. So leave the money in the cafe, leave it in the restaurant, keep your books clean. Start the game knowing I want to get out in year three or two um, and, and just sell um, with good books and systems in place that, you know, I don't like the restaurants that are associated with personalities or you know famous chefs, yep. they're very hard to sell. You can't sell them. Basically, it's a fancy uh, sit out because the chef's gone, and you're always going to be benchmarked against the last good chef. Yeah, go ahead, James. Oh, so I'm just wondering. So when you look at the price of of restaurants, there's a lot of there's a lot of variation in them. What appear to be bargains? Should you look at those bargains, or are, are they really cheap for a really good reason? A bargain is only a bargain if you know how to change it. Yes. Because somebody, somebody has, has done their dough on it, somebody has lost, or some, somebody has, you know, look, things happen. Uh, James, this week alone, I've had, I've listed two businesses for sale in Perth. One, the guy has a tumour on his brain, uh, not malignant, but it is affecting him. Yep. Um, he's, he's shocked. I've known him for probably seven years. He rings me this week, tells me the sad news, and I'm going to help him get out. I'm going to sell it. He's a good little business. He makes a tidy little business. Um, he's a Japanese guy. Um, really nice man and very honourable. His books are squeaky clean. Basically, uh, there's there's bargains are only a bargain if you know how to make it a real good purchase or a good smart investment. You know, sometimes you can pick up a great fit out that some somebody has failed and they've put in amazing, you know, a decent grease grease trap, a good ventilation. They've put in lovely toilets and lovely bathrooms. They've overcapitalized. But they have abandoned them, and then you walk in, and so long as you get the rent, the landlord gets the rent, you get the use of them, you know? Yep, yep. That's a bargain to me. But you must have done your research. You must have done, you know, why? Is there going to be roadworks in the area? Is there going to be redevelopment in the area? Why is it a bargain? If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Yes, yeah. So take, take your time and talk to people. You know, you can ring up brokers and you can ring up business brokers or leasing agents and go for a coffee with them. Tell them what you're looking for. Tell them if, they, if it meets this criteria to contact you. Go out and if you see it advertised somewhere, then there's something really wrong with it. What you want to do is you want to build a network of agents that know you, that if something juicy comes on, they know who to call. And yep. you're not competing with everybody in the public. That's how you get a bargain. That's probably good advice. People entering the game um, are, are shy. They don't. So you, you get one chance to make a first impression with a with a landlord or a leasing agent or a, a business broker or a finance broker. And if you have a plan and you, you've you've engaged with marketing and you have made an allocation for that and you have a, a direction and you have an exit strategy, 
um, you'll be taken seriously and you'll be offered juicy opportunities. Stuff that hasn't been built yet, but then you can sign up for it and you can get good contributions. And then you flip, flip it in 18 months or two years, build it up, flip it and do the next project. Exactly. And take some time off. Yeah, rest. A lot of people in the in hospitality don't realize the hours and it takes over your family life and your relationships. And, and what is your level of fitness? You know, can you stand on your feet for 11 hours straight? Are you happy to do that five nights a week and get up early the next morning and go to the market? And I think that that's one of the big things. That, that's part of the horror that people realize when they start yeah. in, in a restaurant. They think, oh, my God, the hours are just absolutely crushing. And then what happens is a lot of the time is you get used to it. And then the original people lose sight of their original dream that they had when they bought the place. It's slowly yeah, beaten absolutely. out. Absolutely, yeah. This is the truth. This week, I had two phone calls. One from a restaurant I sold in August of last year and another from a restaurant I sold on the 5th of December, just gone. Yep. And I stay in touch with my clients. You know, I call in for coffee. How are you going? Do you want a hand? Um, you, do you want me to look at your labor costs for you? You know, how you, I stay in touch. It's, it's not, I just don't do a deal and then fade away. I kind of build a long-term relationship. I got two phone calls this week. One guy rings me and says, Robbie, I've made a mistake. I want to get out. How do I get out? He's two months and 10 weeks in, in a business that he paid. And it cost him just under 330000 The second uh, phone call was from a, a client as well who uh, rang me. And she said, um, I'm just exhausted. I'm physically drained. And I had ha- have a health scare. And I'm going in for tests on Monday. And uh, I can't do this anymore. Yep. And just get me out. Some guys would be going, oh, that's great. You know, more business for me. My heart's broken. You know, there, there are two people that, one guy spent $7,000 on a due diligence. Yep. One guy spent $7,000 with his accountant to check that this was a good fit for him. So why 10 months, uh, 10 weeks later are you bailing out? I'm not criticizing for bailing out, but, you know, if you had taken that time and that money and just, what well, the impact was that he's not at home anymore and he hasn't seen his family anymore and he's spending every hour God gave him sitting in his cafe uh, in his restaurant trying to figure out how to make it better and it's draining him of his joy to be uh, the reason for living uh, and he's smart enough to say right I'm getting out yeah, uh, yeah. it's know, tough you know, isn't it uh, knowing oh my goodness you know uh, like it's, it's scary but I think you have to have an, a timer and you have to listen if it becomes apparent that you should get out, don't wait until the ship is taken in water and nearly going under. Talk to a professional. Talk to an accountant. Ask the accountant to recommend a broker. Or talk, or, or you know, if you have a relationship with a broker or a leasing agent, get referrals. Who sh- Look, I need help. Do you know anyone that can help me? Put your hand up. If you're at the beach and you're in trouble, you put your hand up and the lifeguard comes in and saves you. There are people out there that will try and help and you need to network with, with professionals and forget the pride. Sometimes people make mistakes, but you can be, they can be saved. They can be helped. It's one of the things I find interesting about the restaurant industry is that it's fairly disconnected. That Not a lot of restaurant owners talk to other restaurant owners. But they, they, they think they're the enemy. Yeah, yeah. They're not the enemy. They're your business associates. <laughs> a precinct works because of, of a diverse selection of offerings. I'd rather be beside 50 restaurants than to be out on my own. Um, talk to them. Get festivals happening. You know, share uh, insights. When you're hiring a staff and they've worked in such and such a place, ring the owner. What's your thoughts on employee X? Oh, yeah, they're good. And they just want to change their career and they want to add to their repertoire. Fine. Oh, that guy, no, he was selling ice out of the back of the bin room. Uh, don't touch him. Do you, like... Talk to your fellow restaurant owners or your fellow fellow cafe owners. They're not the enemy. They're in the same boat as you. Excellent. Well, that's some awesome advice. We've gone through lots of things today. Thank you very much. And I think what we'll do is we'll do a couple more because um, obviously you're an expert in this area. And I know that buying a restaurant is something that a lot of people are interested in as we've discussed, selling a restaurant. Mm. So I think it'd be really interesting to talk to you about, you know, the kind of work that needs to be done to to sell. And lease negotiations 
uh, I think, yep. are a bit of an arcane art and too many people don't know what they can ask for. They don't know how it's sort oh. of, you know, they don't know Absolutely, how. Absolutely, James, yeah. So I think it would be really good to get you back and we'll, we'll talk about leasing as well because uh, I'm sure yep. that plenty of people have got plenty of questions about lease arrangements, the, 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 the oh, process absolutely. for the negotiations. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I can tell. I, I'll give you the, the tips and the secrets what makes a landlord smile and what gets a property manager to say yes. Yep. And it's, it's knowing how to, what to ask for, how to ask for it. And I'd love to share that with you. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much, Robbie. So there'll be, I'll, Cheers, James. I'll put some details in the show notes on where people can contact you. But yeah, thanks for your time today. I love the chance. It's great to talk to somebody like you that knows what they're talking about. It's so refreshing, pal. No worries. Love it. Thank you. Thanks, James. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. So there you go. Lots of ideas about the process that you can take when you're trying to buy a restaurant. And I think it's one of those things that uh, sadly, I don't think a lot of people are going to listen to this podcast because everyone's pretty much got a restaurant. Uh, I think a few people will, will sort of we do get information requests from time to time about people who are looking to it to buy one and that's why we did this podcast i think a lot more people are going to be interested in the how to sell one and once again the lease negotiations let's try and work out what those tricks are to be able to get the best out of your lease because you're paying it 24 7 you want to try and get the best lease that you possibly can to set you up for success once again it's great to talk to someone who agrees with me you know fit out you've got to be really careful about your fit out what sort of roi are you going to be getting at from your fit out because far too often people spend far too much money uh, and get far too little return and that if you're borrowing that money it places a lot of stress on your cash flow that's about it. So if you've got something out of the show, please leave a review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate that for the Secret Source podcast. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. We're doing more and more of our marketing on LinkedIn now and having a lot of success with it. So it'd be great to see you on LinkedIn. And that's it. I hope you have a busy week. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com.